This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 104, recorded on May 14th, 2015. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hello there. How are you? I'm well. It's a beautiful day here. It's spring. So, guess what? What's that? We're going to get some rain. Ooh, <laughs> we had some rain already. So, rain in May is unusual here. But we may have it, and who knows whether it's going to do some good or not. I couldn't say. But better that than, than no the rain. opposite. Better than no rain. Well, very good. Good to hear it. Uh, my heart goes out to California for being so dry, but uh, these things are beyond our control. <laughs> uh, also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How's your golf? I haven't <clears throat> played in a little while. We've had um, graduations. Uh graduation season here and i've had two uh students defend their thesis in the last week caitlin flynn hey. and zach abbott wow i'll Wonderful. give them a shout out nice congratulations yeah thanks and what then my the, daughter graduated from law school on saturday hey. <laughs> Neat. so what's up for her next she's going to do a clerkship in dc nice yeah wow wow well things are happening huh you bet <laughs> <laughs> also joining us today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Charleston. Huh? We have Chamber of Commerce weather today. It is absolutely spectacular. Graduation is tomorrow morning, and the humidity is low, and the sun is out. Our, our commencement is outside in our horseshoe, so it's quite an event, and we always worry about rain. I can tell it's graduation time here at the medical school because I see people walking around dressed up. Mm. And usually they just don't look that dressed up, you know, because they must be parents walking around. So I think ours is soon too. But our semester tomorrow, it's over. I have to get my grades in. I'm grading exams. I graded 130 exams and 100 wow. kidding. and 130 essays. Boy, that's hard. Oh, you are a saint. No, I don't. Think Who's so. this? Medical students? No, gra uh, undergraduates. I teach an undergraduate virology course. Oh, that's right. That's right. Wow. And, um, 130 essays. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, um, but that's okay. I like teaching virology. It's not a problem. How do you keep? How do you? be consistent. Um, one of the challenges I had when I graded 88 of those things um, just the last couple of weeks is I had to do them 10 at a time because otherwise I would either get too hard or too easy <laughs> yeah, yeah, in my I grading. Understand. Well, I wrote the exam, so I know what the answer should be. And I'm a little, I'm a little. Is that a necessary condition to know the answer? <laughs> it's requi generally required. You must have a rubric to assign a point yeah, by a rubric. for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I'm a little easier on the final because it's a hard course and people, a lot of people have not done all that well. Now I have a TA, but you know, I find <laughs> I had the TA grade the other two exams this year and then, and then the students come and ask me to regrade them. You know, like <laughs> half of them and I find mistakes. So I figure, let me just regrade, I'll just grade them myself. That way I don't have to regrade them. So we'll see. I've never graded them all before, but it's tough. <laughs> it takes a long time. It takes like three full days. And many cups of coffee. But that's fine. I, I have a good time teaching and I, I'm sad when it's over because I get to know these kids and they, they're interested. And a lot of them tell me, you know, I didn't know that viruses were so cool and some of them want to do virology now. So what better can I do? That's right? great. Yeah, we it's have great jobs. Great. It's just marvelous. And one thing they tell me, which I have to say, this is really important if you want to teach well. They say, I have a passion and enthusiasm for the field that makes them like it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. You can't teach if you don't have that passion, right? Right. So, I mean, I can do this because I've been doing it so long. Uh, I don't know if I could teach anything else. Uh, <laughs> and I'll bet none of our listeners are surprised to hear that they said that about you, Vincent. Well, I don't know about that's that right. because I... uh, you don't know people, but... Um, I feel that at this point in my career, I can I can really teach. Whereas you know, 
25 years ago, I didn't know what I was talking about. I mean, I could <laughs> teach, but I didn't know. Right, Elio? Could I mean, make you have... the connections. Yeah, well, see the passion is the essential ingredient. Without it, nothing works. Yeah. And yeah. It, you can't be passionate unless you know something, right? Well, so, that helps. <laughs> you know, yes. it's funny. I went to the high school uh, yesterday, Tuesday. To, so there's an English teacher there. She assigns the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks to her freshman, yeah. right? And so every year she asks me to come and talk to them because I'm mentioned in the book and she knows I, I live in the same town. So I went to teach and I was talking to her and I said, you know, this passion is really important. She said, that's really interesting because I teach, you know, 10 books and I don't like all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's oh hard my. to be it's hard to be she said i don't like some dickens book and she said it's hard to be passionate about something you don't like and i said yeah well i like every virus i talk about <laughs> <laughs> it's no problem she thought that was funny this episode of twim is brought to you by asm microbe 2016 it's the all-new meeting that combines the american society for microbiology's general meeting and icac all under one roof the largest gathering of microbiologists from anywhere, well, at least on Earth, who knows about elsewhere, the premier global event showcasing the best microbial sciences in the world, the only meeting that explores the total spectrum of microbiology and gives you a true transdisciplinary experience. You have the general meeting with its basic microbiology and ICAC with the clinical applications. So you'll find all the great programming of the general meeting and ICAC, transdisciplinary sessions, a special profession of microbiology track, posters, networking opportunity lounges, continuing educations, just a ton of stuff. You're going to love it. 200 sessions, over 5,000 posters, seven program tracks. Amazing forum for interaction among this global community of multidisciplinary scientists. And you'll be able to see the product and service providers to give you the solutions to what you need to solve. Uh, the call for sessions is until May 19th. Maybe by the time you hear this, it'll be too late. But nevertheless, you should go over to asm.org slash microbe 2016 to check out what's going on in bookmark it. And so you'll remember to register for this pretty cool meeting. All right. We have for you today, we have a snippet and a paper. And I will turn the microphone to Michael to give us the snippet. All right. Um, many of you have probably heard about the paper that we're going to discuss today in today's snippet because it's been getting quite a bit of buzz in the popular press and it's likely driving the anti-vaxxers absolutely crazy. The paper was published last week in the journal Science and was entitled Long-Term Measles-Induced Immunomodulation Increases Overall Childhood Infectious Disease Mortality and was authored by Michael J. Minna, who presently is an MD-PhD student at Emory University, but he did this work while he was an undergraduate at Princeton, along with C. Jessica Metcalf, Rick DeSwart, uh, ADME Osterhaus, and Brian Grenfell, and they're respectively from Princeton, Emory, Erasmus University, and Rotterdam. And so this paper intrigued me before I began seeing it in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and it even made our paper, the Post and Courier, in uh, Tuesday's medical section. And they had me at the title, but then I do what I always do, read the abstract. And it forced me to ask uh, a number of questions, uh, principally just looking at, at the title is, uh, does this mean vaccination of measles could decrease childhood infectious diseases overall? And, you know, so what do we know about measles? Well, we know immunosuppression after a measles infection is known to predispose people to opportunistic infections. And in fact, you know, that's sort of dogma of in infectious diseases. If you get a viral infection, you can get a secondary infection often very easily for a period of, of several weeks to, to months. And what these authors have done is they used population data. They went back to old statistics and the author showed that measles has a more prolonged effect on host resistance 
extending over two to three years. In which reducing is, it. Uh, in, in reducing. Well, it actually, before the vaccination process came about, but it, it actually had a prolonged effect on host resistance over extending over two to three years. What effectively a measles infection does, I'll cut to the punchline, a measles infection effectively causes immunological amnesia. And they use that phrase in the, in the, the text of, of their paper. And I just think that really distills down the essence of their data and it's really elegant how they came to that conclusion that a measles infection induces immunological amnesia. It works so, well too, since we have memory B cells. <laughs> so the language works really well. Perfect. Right. And the paper found that non measles infectious disease mortality, and they contrasted it in high income or what we're now referring to these nations as our resourced countries as opposed to under-resourced countries was tightly coupled to measles incidence. And at this lag in both pre and post um, vaccine eras, and we've been vaccinating individuals against the measles virus for about 50 years now. I, I remember about 50 years ago when I got my measles vaccine because it was a big deal because it was a shot. Up until that point in time, um, I, I remember getting vaccines in, in elementary school and we got the measles vaccine in school in Chicago as part of um, you know a, a vaccine campaign. And previously we had the polio vaccine uh, on the sugar cube. So this one had a shot. So that's probably why I remembered it. And back to the paper, what these authors concluded is that this long-term immunological consequences of measles drive this interannual fluctuation in non-measles death. And they, they just looked at it from a simple death certificate from from infectious diseases. And then where it really gets to be science worthy uh, to be published in the journal Science. And here's where it gets interesting for my B cell immunologist friends. And this is where the bioinformatic, if you will, or epidemiological data gets consistent with some of the cutting edge immunology is that they attribute this immunosuppressive effect of measles to depletion of the B and T, T lymphocytes. And their data then provides an explanation for the long-term benefits, which Elio tumbled to, of measles vaccination in preventing all-cause infectious disease. And so here's the punchline, if you will. By preventing measles-associated memory, immune memory loss, this vaccination then confers po- protects or conf- helps to uh, maintain polymicrobial herd immunity. And this is why it's probably driving the anti-vaxxers crazy. It's another reason to vaccinate uh, against be- measles. And so the manner that the authors went through this is they went back to old data and they ask uh, a number of, of fundamental questions specifically uh, looking, and here's the principal question they asked, if if loss of acquired immunological memory after measles exists, the resulting impaired host resistance should be detectable by looking at epidemiological data collected during periods when measles was common Mm -hmm. and – in contrast to previous investigations that typically focused on low resource settings, should be apparent in these high resourced nations like the United States and Great Britain and uh, Northern Europe, Denmark. where they, Denmark, where mortality from opportunistic infections during acute immune, measles immune suppression was low. And so they, they had four principal hypothesis that they use to test this um, epidemiological data. The first one they asked, and it was a really simple, straightforward question, they required 
that first, non-measles mortality should be correlated with measles incidence data. And so you just have a very straightforward graph of comparing and contrasting. You count the number of deaths and you track measles. And what they found in all locations or nations that they evaluated this, measles incidence showed significant association with mortality. It was pretty black and white to to my eye, and I'm not uh, by any way, shape, or form a mathematics guru to evaluate the appropriateness of the math they use. I'm trusting the science editors to have validated that the the curve fitting and all the other things that they did were were appropriate. But the graphs, to my eye, are really pretty spectacular. Um, you know, the the measles goes up, and then there's a lag, and you can see the deaths being attributed. And then what was really cool is they looked at vaccines and Denmark came to the vaccination table late. They didn't start vaccinating their population into 1980. And so that's what really gave me uh, tremendous comfort in the data in that you could see that the Denmark curves were shifted with vaccination. So it was really pretty cool. The second question is an immune memory loss mechanism should be present as a strengthening of this association when measles incidents, uh, measles incidents data are transformed to reflect an accumulation of a previous measles case. And in other words, you should see the shadow of measles reflected in the graphs. And again, they were able to see that. The third hypothesis that they addressed is that the strength or the correlation of the data, if you will, should be greatest when the mean duration over which the cases are accumulated matches the mean duration required to restore immunological memory after the measles virus uh, infection. And that one is is got much more math in it. And it, it forced me to ask myself a question that really puzzled me. And I wanted to uh, throw this out to Vincent because he's the card-carrying virologist. Is since the measles vaccine, Vincent, is a live attenuated vaccine, why is it – because I always viewed a live attenuated vaccine, you get a real infection – that's just shorter and doesn't cause all the the disease symptomology. But if this magic immune modulation caused by meas- a measles infection is causing this amnesia, why then doesn't the attenuated vaccine mm-hmm. do that? Mm-hmm. And yep. is it because it's growing in chick embryo eggs and it's changing the virus such that it's no longer having its effect on us? I think that's part of it. The virus has a, a number of mutations in the genome compared with well type measles virus as a result of extensive passage, right? Mm-hmm. But also it binds to a different receptor. That's got to be it. And the, so I think the tropism is, is slightly altered and the, or I would say the virulence of the, of the virus, if you will, is also markedly reduced. So those two things together, you do not uh, immunosuppress with the vaccine, that's for sure. Uh, and and that gets into the the second really cool experiment that they did. Um, one of the things I should point out, given the incidence of, the, you know, measles has been popular this winter because of the Disneyland uh, adventure of just after Christmas. And it illustrates the high infectivity of measles with uh, an r not where the average measles patient will infect likely between 12 and 18 other in individuals. And so they then tried it on another highly infectious airborne transmitted disease that has a similar uh, mode of trans- transmission and a similar r not, and that was pertussis. And so they asked, and and I'll quote here, as a further test of the immunosuppressive impact of measles, we carried out a similar analysis on pertussis. And pertussis is, again, the vaccine-preventable disease. And it's not known to be immunosuppressive. 
And and so it goes back to what Vincent just said about the trophism of the virus and inducing that, if you will, immunological amnesia that that measles is really causing. So summing up this this little snippet, their results suggest an extra and they term dynamic dynamical twist where measles virus infections could also reduce population immunity against other infections in which this immune modulation caused by the trophism of the virus um, is, is literally wiping out our ability to deal with things that we may have been previously vaccinated for or actually acquired natural immunity to. And, and so if you have to give your kid one vaccine, it's got to be the measles vaccine <laughs> because otherwise yeah. none of the other vaccines make any sense if, God forbid, you get measles. And we had a discussion, I think, on a couple of twins ago about the fact that if you were born before 1957, you likely had measles. And so you don't obviously need to take the vaccine. But how many kids – did measles kill before 1957? Well, this, is, this is interesting because I bet that a lot of people, me included some time ago, would have thought of measles as a fairly simple, mm-hmm. fairly mild childhood disease. That's right. Like the rest of them, rubella and chicken pox and so forth. It's what you have when you're a kid and that's it. But on uh, what, what surprised me, this is, goes back a ways, is that when uh, when the Americas were invaded by Europeans, one of the great, as you know, one of the reasons why a, a handful of Spaniards could conquer huge empires is because they brought with them a lot of dangerous organisms, including especially smallpox. But measles was second to that. It yeah, was right. almost as right. important. Right. And so measles in a non immunized population can be devastating. I mean, from a simple diarrhea. From a simple diarrhea. It killed millions of people. So the idea that this is a mild childhood disease that we can can live with and not pay attention with is totally wrong. This is a major disease. And also the the point that uh, when you vaccinate, you're not only protecting yourself, but you're protecting your community, not only from from the measles virus, but from these other infections. So. They actually say in the last, in the last sentence, they say, Elio, what you say, the, uh, the public has a view of measles as a benign childhood disease. Right. And that's wrong. It's wrong. Uh, by the way, Vincent, you may for, for clarification, in, 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 uh, maybe uh, some listeners will wonder about this. Would you contrast measles with HIV infection? Ah, well, so HIV is also severely immunosuppressive, right? That's um, right. Yeah, that's why I ask. <laughs> yeah, so, it be, it, you know, measles virus infects B and T cells. Uh, HIV infects T cells and destroys them. And uh, over the years, you lose them. And at the end, you actually die of opportunistic infections, not of, of the virus itself. So uh, when I talk about immunosuppression, I talk about measles virus and um, – HIV, but other viruses immunosuppress as well. Rubella, which is part of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, uh, also immunosuppresses. It would be interesting to see if there's any protection uh, conferred by that as well. And one thing I wanted to mention before we move on is they have a couple, if you're interested in how the math was done, they have a couple of really neat tutorials in the supplemental section that are videos showing you how to read the graphs in a video format, showing you how the math was done to actually come up with their conclusions, which for someone like me who tries to understand the math they're doing, it was a great help in appreciating the validity of the conclusions that they were drawing from from the data. It wasn't just black magic, pour numbers in and, <laughs> you know, magic comes out. And so I, I would – commend you to that. And if you're interested in learning about measles and there's some really neat pictures, I found an article by um, Carl Zimmer in, of all places, the National Geographic 
that was available online for free that um, as actually highlighting measles and it has a couple of cool pictures of the measles rash in case you haven't seen anyone with the morbilliform um, measles rash. I'd also add that um, a similar phenomenon has been really well documented showing that, um, and this is work from Keith Klugman, uh, who, who with his colleagues studied 37,000 infants in um, South Africa before and after introduction of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. And they were able to demonstrate that by taking this vaccine against a bacterial respiratory pathogen, they actually reduced incidence and hospitalizations due to seven different respiratory viruses Mm. by 31%. So this is a a nature medicine um, paper published in 2004. Mad High is the first author. Wow. So So, vaccines are good. (laughs) Like I said, this paper <laughs> drives directly the anti-vaxxers crazy. <laughs> yeah. The only the only thing to add, I'm afraid, is that vaccines are good when they work. Sure. <laughs> lots that we have lots of diseases for which we have no vaccine. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. a shame. Yeah, and that's people are working on them and hopefully we'll add to our armamentarium. How's that for a big word? Very nice. So the measles <laughs> in a in a developed nation, uh the measles lethality is about one in a thousand infections, but it goes up substantially in kids who are undernourished. It's even That's worse. Right. So this yeah, is I was going to say that. It's another reason to uh, get more. So right now we have a lot of measles globally because we don't get vaccine to everyone who needs it. There's, mm-hmm. There are many countries with still many cases, uh, but the you know the WHO is is targeting measles for eradication. It and, does. Uh, yeah, uh. it's eradicable. So. Um, that's well, that's 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 true for almost all purely human related diseases, infections. Yeah, if you it? have if they're human <laughs> only, and if you get lifelong immunity, uh, it should be eradicable. Yeah, so small. Pox There's no natural that. reservoir and right. all that. Right. Well, well, those those bugs that have really terrific mechanisms for antigenic variation, um, yeah, create substantial mm. challenges for designing vaccines. Sure. Short half Well, yes, yeah, so influenza is a problem, but they, of course, are also in animals. So you couldn't eradicate those anyway. Uh, HIV, mm, you know, you have, all this, you have the latent reservoir you can't get rid of, so that's a problem. But it does do the antigenic variation as well. That's right. And then the star of them all is hepatitis C with its quasi-species. Hep C will be eradicated with antivirals. Yep. It looks really good. Because that's also only a human uh, virus. Thank you, Michael. Lovely Thank paper. you. Really, really good paper. Very, very important stuff. Immunize. This episode is also sponsored by ASM Conferences, the newest and most exclusive conference offered by the American Society for Microbiology. These are designed to showcase cutting-edge science in a, in a small meeting environment. If you've been to a Gordon conference with you know, very few people, it's great. You can talk to everyone. The talks are fabulous. This is what this is going to be like. Uh, Each person attending this meeting is a speaker, a poster presenter, or an oral abstract presenter. There are no observers at ASM conferences. Attendance limited to 50 people. This makes collaboration and interaction better, and these will be application-based or invitation only. And the way the meeting is set up, They'll be able to focus on a single topic, technology training, or an issue of concern. Whatever is needed, they can do this in this really focused way. These conferences also feature discussions, social functions for networking, and collaborations. And they are all going to be held over weekends to minimize disruptions uh, of your research lives. You can propose a topic. Uh, The deadline is May 15th again. It'll be done by the time you hear this, but I do want you to go to asm.org slash conferences to check out this new meeting sponsored by the American Society for Microbiology. Sounds pretty exciting. I'd like to go to one. All right, the next is a paper published in a journal that I don't usually look at, um, although these days if you do keywords, you'll get articles in it, and I don't think we've ever done a twin paper in cell metabolism. Nope. (laughs) Nope. That's a nope. <laughs> nope. The name of the article is Metabolism Links Bacterial Biofilms and Colon Carcinogenesis. There are lots of authors on this paper, many of them well-known in the field of colon cancer, at least to me. 
The first author is Caroline Johnson, and in there is Drew Pardole, who is very well known in this area, Cynthia Sears, and the last author is Gary Sayuzdak. Shoesdak. Shoesdak. How do you know that, Michelle? Because I had a great chat with Caroline, which I'll talk about later. Caroline Johnson. Johnson. Oh, she told you how to pronounce it. Okay. Great. (laughs) Wonderful. All right. I'm really interested in colon cancer um, because both of my parents died from that disease. Okay. So I'm in big trouble, I guess. (laughs) And I want to make sure. You've been screened, I hope. I get screened every week. Oh, that's good. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I get screened regularly, yes. And so far, I've been okay. Um, And that's the thing about colon cancer. If you pick it up early... It is uh, curable, but if you pick it up late, like my dad or mother, it's it's just it's fatal. It's uh, these these cancers, colorectal cancer, the official name. Over a quarter of a million people every year, and your risk in your lifetime in a, in a nation like the U.S. is about five percent. That's very high, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty high. Uh, so if you find it early, you, cure rates are seventy ninety percent. But as I said, if you don't get it early, it's a really high mortality rate. Ranks in the top three causes of cancer-related deaths uh, globally. So it's an important disease, and a lot of people are working on it. We know it's a genetic. There is a genetic component. Uh, mutations in the genomes of people with colon cancer have been identified, and you know the idea is that certain mutations accumulate in certain genes slowly over many years. This allows progression from a cell that continues to divide to uh, those that make tumors uh, eventually. So this paper is focusing on the microbiome and its products. Now, on TWIM before, I think number 71, we talked about a study of how altering the gut microbiome in mice can lead to inflammation and cancer. And Michelle will remember that one because... That's right. That was for... Work done here at Michigan and by you, Pat Schloss's group. Right, and you made the title for that episode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Colon Little cancer. Shop of Horrors. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors, part two. So a number of groups have been asking. That God, the colon is full of, of our microbiome, of course. So it's an obvious cofactor in carcinogenesis besides the mutations that have been involved. And a lot of people are trying to do studies where they look at the microbiome of people with cancer and without but, you know, it doesn't always give clear-cut answers. So people are now looking at what the bacteria produce. And I think we've talked about this before on TWIM, how it often may not be the particular bacteria, but what metabolites they're actually producing that may affect whatever it is uh, you are looking at. So these authors uh, have previously shown that biofilms formed by the gut microbiome, are associated with colon cancers. And in particular, they're linked to where the cancer is. So they talk about right-sided colon uh, cancers. So the right side of your colon, if you're looking at a person, uh, the right side is the descending colon, if I get my anatomy right. And the left side is the ascending colon. No, no. If you're looking at a person. Oh, if you're looking at yeah, but if you are yourself. If you're the, looking down at yourself, it's the other way. <laughs> yeah, it's the other, it's way. the other way around. Right. It's the whole stage right, stage left. Yeah, so that that because they talk in this paper about uh, right and left sided, and but they mean they mean you yourself. No, not, they mean looking not somebody at you. looking at you. No, they mean looking at you because I, I figured it out that <laughs> so and they have a little picture here. So on one side of the picture, that's the descending colon. They mainly see cancers without biofilm. So this is it. Virtually all right-sided colons are, have biofilm. Yeah, hey, you're right, Delio. It's your side. Damn it, I got it wrong. <laughs> all right, right-sided First colon. time ever. It's okay. No, that's no, not the first time. There are many times. I just, I just work around It's the it. enthusiasm. <laughs> so if you're enthusiastic, you can be wrong sometimes, right? So it's looking at yourself, right? The right side is the ascending colon. So that means things have just come out of the small intestine and they're proceeding upwards. And there they've shown previously virtually all the colon cancers on the right side have biofilms associated with them. Where on the left side, which is the descending colon, it's a, the contents are heading out. They're, they're going down towards the rectum. Most of, those don't, most of those cancers don't have biofilms. 
By the way, can I interrupt for a second? <laughs> yes, of This course. illustrates a very important point that when we look at the microbiome of the intestine via feces, right. we are to some extent fooling yeah. ourselves. Mm-hmm. Because the average. The, yeah. It's an average or whatever it is. It's not representative of what's there. And what's there is extraordinarily hard to study. It can only really be studied either by people who are fistulated who are sick because mm-hmm. they, they had an ostomy for a reason, or people in, uh, during an operation or before an, during an operation. This is extremely hard to study in the normal person. In fact, practically impossible. Right. So our, uh, on the one, this is a paradox. On the one hand, or almost the easiest kind of specimen to obtain from a human being is feces, and almost the most difficult specimen to obtain from a human being is what happens in the natural condition in the gut. It's also hard to get brain tissue. It's true. <laughs> it's true. It's <laughs> Which is really, I mean, it would be, it would be nice. But I, I tell you, no, I would trust the microbiology of brain tissue more than I trust yeah. some of the uh, things done with the intestine. I mean, this is why blood is, is always taken. It's so easy to get, right? Right. Respiratory secretions, et cetera. But these other tissues, which would be so informative, very hard to get. And And the surface area is incredible here. You have to remember how big the intestine is and how small the microbes are. And so in the just the distance alone, you can have right. many, many different environments. Exactly. Well, people do, do know that. I mean, they talk yeah, about Yeah, they have the sectioned it. But yeah. even still, I, I think it's, it's an important point to make out because, you know, even when they take this to little tiny mice where they'll sacrifice the animal in, in order to get the tissue, it's still a very challenging activity. Yeah. That's right. Well, and that's why some of the methods they used here are direct inspection Mm -hmm. and preserving spatial location are so powerful. But you'll get to that, Vincent. I hope so. I hope I get it right. All right, so the hypothesis here is that somehow the biofilm is influencing the cancer through the metabolites that are produced, the the so-called metabolome, everything that is, uh, all the small molecules that are produced. All right, and so maybe the the biofilm is producing metabolites and these somehow enhance cancer growth. So what they did in this study is they have two patient groups of individuals who are uh, going under, I think they're mostly surgical uh, patients. Uh, but I think so, they're all surgical. All surgical, no, no colonoscopy sample surg- uh, patients, oh. I guess. And one is at Johns Hopkins and the other is at the Karolinska. And they have normal and colon cancer samples. So, you know, in a, in a colon, in a colon surgery, they resect a piece of your colon and they usually go beyond the tumor, right? To get clean margins, get clean margins, as they say, and they have some normal tissue there. And then of course, in the middle is the tumor tissue. So they could get some of these and do their studies on them. So there, you know, they're taking a big piece out. And if you want to work on it, you just get your IRB approval because it's otherwise going to be thrown away. Mm-hmm. So this is an ideal situation. So what they did is did they use mass mass spectrometry, you know, highly sophisticated, state of the art. You can take a sample and know uh, the, the molecules that are in it, and they compare the metabolome of the tissues, the normal and the cancer. They found three hundred and four differentially regulated metabolites. In other words, that were different in the normal and cancer sample, and one that they focus on in the rest of this paper is went up ninefold, 9.4-fold, N1N12 diacetylspermine, so acetylated spermine. And spermines, you may remember from biochemistry, are polyamines They're found in all cells, eukaryotic cells. They're used, they can be found and bound to nucleic acids. Uh, they are essential for growth of some bacteria. So diacetylspermine is a metabolite of spermine. They're, they also found uh, upregulated... Uh, in cancer s- tissues, again, N1-acetylspermine, so a different acetylation, then N1-acetylspermidine, so two different spermines in one spermidine. They also found some phospholipids and fatty acids that were upregulated, but when they compare the results with, with the results that they then did with the Karolinska samples, uh, only the 
polyamine metabolites, the spermines, the spermidines are elevated, not the phospholipids and fatty acids. So they're very excited now that they found in two distinct populations, polyamine metabolites elevated uh, in colon cancer tissues. And what's neat about that Swedish cohort is that they um, well, would have a different diet. And so mm-hmm. it allowed them yeah, to right. uh, see whether that variable was impacting, and, and clearly it didn't. So that that's a really yeah. powerful uh, collaboration. They have a different diet and they have different weather too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, that's one of the things I, I really wonder is, is the diet of Sweden any different than the diet from the folks around Johns Hopkins? Did they control? Did they formally control – for that by either getting a diet dictionary or something along those lines. And it doesn't seem to be, but I would bet it is. You know, here in the U.S. I we don't eat as much fish. They eat a lot of fish. We eat too much fried, you know, fast food type stuff. Especially in Maryland. <laughs> uh, they they love the... Oh, the crabs, right. The crabs. So, I mean, with all those spices on them, yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right, so next they ask whether... Uh, biofilms make a difference. So do colon tissues with biofilms differ in the metabolome compared to colon tissues without biofilms? So when they look for that at those tissues by their mass spectrometry, they find 28 dysregulated metabolites and the same three spermine or spermidines that we mentioned are upregulated in biofilm positive cancer tissues. Okay, not only that, but in those few left side of the colon cancers, that's on your left side, the descending colon, <laughs> that where they find biofilms, the, the these metabolites are up as well. So it's not just location, 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 but it, it matters. They're up when you have a biofilm, these spermine uh, spermidines, okay? Uh, and then there are a couple of other metabolites that are up as well, but uh, they don't really focus on those for the rest of the paper. So are you thinking Hmm. that what we need to think about is how to denude a biofilm from a colon if you have a familial uh, history of colon cancer to see whether or not that can actually lower your risk? Because it, it all goes back to the receptors of, you know, how biofilms stick stick to us and maybe people who are predisposed like your poor mother and father to colon cancer just were the unfortunate individuals to get a biofilm early in their life Mm. that allowed them to have these chemicals exposed to their epithelial layer for a prolonged period of time and hence the cancer. But if they were a, if you were able to have given your parents uh, an antibiotic cocktail that would denude the biofilm from the descending colon, would that then have uh, reset their risk? That's a good question. You know, my mother and father grew up in very different places. My dad grew up in Italy. My mother grew up in the U.S. And so something had to be in common. Um, I have no, I have none of the known genetic mutations that predispose to colon cancer. The P53. I, yeah, I'm normal at all these sites. So, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's in the end, Michael, that's exactly what they say because, uh, inhibitors of polyamine metabolism have been tried. Uh, they don't work. They don't, they say they have, uh, you know, uneven results, but they say maybe they should be combined with, uh, inhibitors of biofilms. Mm-hmm. How would you disrupt it with an antibiotic, I guess? Well, you can go with bismuth, good old Pepto-Bismol. That, but that disrupts biofilms, really? But Pepto-Bismol disrupts wow. biofilms. I mean, in, that's in, a... In the, in the large intestine? No, the small intestine. But so uh, the question is, the do, you do, a, do you do a bismuth enema? All right. Uh, I'm not doing that every day. <laughs> <laughs> but this is large intestine, right? Yeah, so it's 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 real. I, I just found this thing absolutely fascinating, and this is a short paper in, in cell metabolism. <laughs> the, the others are much longer. Well, They're, short, but it's got just the oh, oh it's it's chock a block full of data, and, and and the different types of methods they brought were really impressive, and that. Um, is because they pulled together such an such a terrific uh, collaborative team. They had pathologists, uh, physicians, a polyamine biochemist, of course, the computational biologists, the analytical biochemists, the microbiologists, all working together. 
And I did have the pleasure of talking with um, the two lead authors. Uh, Carolyn Johnson is a, uh, is a British analytical chemist, mm. um, and she got her PhD at Imperial College with Jeremy Nicholson. And then um, her first postdoc was with um, Fran Gonzalez, where she started working on cancer, and then had the opportunity to join uh, Gary Shustak's lab to kind of combine those interests in metabolomics and cancer to, to study this question. She described um, a bit about their their study. They would have uh, two groups of people, you know, one in Hopkins and one out in Scripps, converse over the phone, so large uh, phone conferences to keep in touch and, and plan uh, the project. And then as needed, they would recruit additional people uh, to the team. One of the um, things that made this powerful is, um, as Michael pointed out, the colon, um, you get a, a pretty large section. And so they were very um, thoughtful about using the, that tissue. When they collected a specimen and sliced it, they could take a segment of it and use it for standard histology. They could take another section and prepare it for the metabolomics. Another section they uh, saved and preserved in a way that will preserve the um, RNA so they can now go back and look at transcriptional profiles. So they had all these different team members who could all use the same samples. So for example, Carolyn told me the story of um, when she had first done all the uh, analytical biochemistry on the samples, just comparing cancer to non-cancerous tissue. And then, you know, sometime later, she got a call from Cindy Sears saying that um, the Christine De, uh, DeJay Craig, who is the other lead author, had just finished doing all the coding and determining which of the samples had biofilms and which didn't. So she asked Caroline then to go back and um, stratify the data according to biofilm presence or absence. And Carolyn said that was just a, a really exciting day when they mm. plugged that information into their um, software suite and got the really clear results that we saw today. Nice. And speaking of that, um, uh, this collaborative science... At Scripps, they have a, a center for metabolomics where they have two different tools available online. So, for example, figure one in this paper is a cloud diagram mm. that allowed them to present an awful lot of information in a, in a succinct form. Oh, nice. yeah. And that is generated by an online tool that they have called um, XCMS Online. So, any user can go on and analyze their metabolomic data using that. And then they have that the graphs that are generated are linked to a online database of metabolites and wow. that is also a, a community service so not only is this team benefiting from their collaborative work but they've also generated these tools that are widely available for the community Christine, I just want to give a little shout out to her. She um, trained first at UC Davis, um, majored in medical microbiology and immunology, and then worked as a technician for a couple of years in a neuroscience lab and got expertise with um, animal models and handling tissues. But her love really is um, the analytical microscopy. So as a PhD student, she joined uh, Cindy Sears' lab, and it was... Um, her thesis work that was first published in the PNAS paper that preceded this one, mm -hmm. and then she contributed to this as well. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add, since we just celebrated Mother's Day, that both Carolyn Johnson and mm -hmm. uh, Christine Craig are uh, the proud mothers of um, infants. One has a girl and one has a boy. So mm -hmm. um, it's neat to see that they are thriving in, in many areas of life. Mm, great. Isn't that <laughs> wonderful? I bet, yeah. neither, I bet neither ever heard of TWIM. Um, I didn't come right out and ask that, but they're both really excited, as are their PIs, and they're looking forward to hearing the show. You know, sometimes people tell you, oh, I, I, I know Twim, right? Like the last, right. last week's guy. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ask them, but uh, it's interesting that some people do. I, I guess they're not real microbiologists here that would be following microbiology continuously and so would listen to it. So, Great. so if there was an analytical biochemistry podcast, would we listen as a way <laughs> to try to expand our understanding so I, we can I bring would. our own research in that area? You know, if it was good, I would listen because uh -huh. I'm always looking for good science podcasts, and it's you know scientists are busy, and, right. and it's only crazy ones like me that uh, that do this for the most part. There are a few others, but mm -hmm. yeah, I would love. That physics podcast, all, all these areas that I like but don't know much about, I would listen and learn for sure. Right. 
And it, that's how we started sort of today is talking about education. And if you think about it, what course do you take to learn how to do this sort of science? Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can't learn this in a silo. It's truly collaborative Man, science. That's absolutely right. And yeah. you have to be open-minded. And, you know, the old adage is there's no such thing as a silly – uh, or uninformed question, you you just have to ask questions. How do you do that? And yeah. if if they're open, and I think that's what this paper really showed is that collaborative science can really move that ball down, to use the football metaphor, down the field in a much quicker manner than just doing this one at a time where you throw out the metabolomic data and you just let it sit there. You really need this integrative approach in order to really move move our our knowledge forward to ask the importance of the biofilm in colon carcinogenesis which also means we need to change our curriculum at our in our graduate programs yes, to better sure. in our, our undergraduate in mm-hmm. our right. undergraduates as well i mean we the undergraduate curriculum should actually revert to the high school and we should start doing collaborative science as an undergraduate and make it all inquiry based i i think everybody from undergrad down needs to get more science Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, it's funny. When I was teaching this high school class the other day, I, I asked them, did anyone not like this book? And one guy raised his hand and I said, why? He said, I don't like science. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him. I said, but you are science. You're the product of it. And he just kind of shook his head. Didn't I guess he didn't get it. But those are the guys you have to come after. You got to tell them yeah. why science is so cool. But it's hard to make it exciting because the teachers in high school aren't scientists, right? And they you don't want them to be, but that's how you get people excited. It's really a tough problem. Well, and, and um, I included in the show notes uh, a publication by the American Academy of Microbiology that is aimed at a general audience to try to increase um, science literacy and to reach people who are truly interested but didn't have a chance to learn. So there is a, a book there called um, yep. – about vaccines where our audience can learn more about we'll these that, issues. Uh, we'll certainly put that in. Yeah. All right. Just a couple more experiments I wanted to tell you, uh, which I thought were cool. One is they used in situ imaging to look at where these metabolites are located within the tissues. So you, you make sections, as Michelle said, and then they probe for the metabolites. And it's very clear that spermine and spermidine metabolites, these polyamine derivatives, acetylated polyamines, are much higher in the cancers versus the normal tissues. So they have sections of cancer tissue, sections of normal tissue. You can see it's elevated. It's quite clear. You know, if you don't, if you don't like to look at the uh, other kinds of data, this is really visual. And they couldn't figure out where the metabolites were coming from. They know enzymatically how they're made in human cells. They they tried to see if some human enzymes were upregulated in the cancers, but uh, they didn't find that. So they were wondering whether uh, the bacterial enzymes that produce these acetylated um, polyamines are involved. But they didn't take that any further, but I presume that, that they will be. They, they next want to try and correlate these metabolites with certain bacteria. So they did 16S ribosomal sequencing of samples. They found some positive associations with certain clostridia and negative uh, associations with some bacteroidetes, but not really pursuing that very much either. They tried giving some of these patients oral antibiotics uh, a day before surgery. Uh, When that was done, they did not see any biofilms on both sides of the colon, and the cultivatable microbial load was much lower uh, they also did not see an increase in the metabolites on the right side of the colon, which remember, these are usually biofilm positive. No metabolite increase when you feed people oral antibiotics. But they did see increases in polyamines when they compared cancer to normal tissue. So the idea here is that both host cells and bacterial biofilms are contributing to this upregulation of polyamine metabolites. And these are associated with cancer, so maybe they play some role. Right. It's an association. We don't know if yet if they're causative, but uh, obviously if we can do some therapies, we might be able to get at that. And, you know, they suggest at the end um, trying some trials where you inhibit both polyamine metabolism and uh, biofilm production. 
So that's that. I thought it was pretty interesting and really taking it a little further, right? It's not just the bacteria, it's what they make and maybe even together with human cells. So it's complicated. It's not going to be easy. But really impressive that they're able to do the histology, get the Beautiful. spatial information, the it's microbes, gorgeous. the host. Yeah. Yep. All right. I want to read a few uh, letters here before we wrap it up. The first is from Mark who writes, Hello, Twim Aggregate. Uh, it's warm and sunny spring weather here in California's Bay Area. The fourth year of drought, with a capital D, is upon us. Please send water. Speaking of water, below is a humorous incident that could be used to draw attention to MRSA or proper hand hygiene. These are probably better suited to informal settings like the bar instead of the classroom. But here it goes. A a town in Texas televised their 428 city council meeting. The mayor recognizes the mayor pro tem who starts to talk about raising MRSA awareness in their community, sharing personal experiences with MRSA victims. The mayor leaves and the mayor pro tem continues to talk. Male urination sounds can be heard and snickering starts as loud flush is heard and the mayor pro tem erupts in laughter, which continues as the mayor returns to the council room. He obviously didn't wash his hands. Within days, a video clip went viral. My friend sent me the link and he saw it here and he provides a link for that if you want to see this. This real life event is quoted from the venerable sophomore movie, The Naked Gun. Detective Frank Dreben had a similar highly fictionalized urinary mishap with an open mic. Fortunately, Twix shows are produced with tethered microphones. <laughs> Speaking of drought, in California, 80% of the water supply is used by agriculture. Our now maladapted water policies re- reward growing high water consuming crops like almonds or rice for export. Governor Jerry Brown has declared a water emergency and is seeking to have households reduce usage in the range of 25 to 33% compared to 2014. People who support conservation have a handy phrase, if it's not brown, don't flush it down. People critical of the governor have morphed this into, if it's brown, then vote it down. (laughs) Let me end with a serious question. How do drought conditions change public health risks? California is now experiencing higher incidence of West Nile virus. TWIV listeners will recall Professor Despommier has explained mechanisms coupled to drought and mosquito habitat several times. Should other risks be expected or shifting between risks? Any mosquito-borne disease would probably increase in a drought as the mosquitoes switch from the birds go away and the mosquitoes start biting people. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what else would be a problem. Does anyone know of anything else? No. I think the, the mosquito link to standing water after lots of rain is, is the best example. I'm going to read one way at the bottom here from Suzanne. This is actually a follow up from last time. She writes, um, for anyone interested in trapping fruit flies without drowning them. Remember we had a list. Oh, yes, the wine discussion. You can put a little wine or I use a piece of overripe banana in a container with a small hole in it. The flies get in but usually can't find their way out. You can then take them outside and release them every now and then when the contents are particularly alcoholic smelling. It seems to me that the flies are slower to fly away as if they were (laughs) drunk. I was glad to hear someone write in favor of using the word Talmudic for your questions. It's really the perfect word for unanswerable questions that are worth asking just for the thinking. This atheist also approves. Talmudic (laughs) questions and midrash are traditions more people should know about just because having a questioning culture is an important and useful thing, I think. Thank you for all you do. That's nice. Glad to hear that. yeah. Again, the intention of using the word Talmudic was not based on religion at all. It was a cultural term. I have uh, one more email now. This is going back to the hand-washing discussion, which was started by John, who's writing this letter and was answered by a few other people. And remember, John, his idea is that you shouldn't make restaurant workers wash their hands. He writes, I have a few observations and comments about TWIM 101 and 102, about hand-washing rules. In his book, Fast Food Nation, Eric Slosher, discusses the relative abilities of regulators and consumers to change food safety practices. Consumers were a powerful force cleaning up slaughterhouses because there was a media frenzy after the -the jack-in-the-box outbreak. Two, the bathroom sinks where I work dispense a trickle of cold water. If you let them run for five minutes, you get a trickle of warm water. Pathogenic bacteria are laughing all the way to the kitchen. Green building rules may make the hand-washing debate irrelevant. 
Three, in my experience, doctors and dentists wear gloves but do not wash their hands in my presence. Freakonomics covered the difficulty of getting doctors to wash their hands, and he gives some links for that. Four, the traffic law analogy on TWIM 101 need, leads to the opposite conclusion than the one proposed. You can build a road network without signs and signals in Europe. The term naked streets is used for unregulated urban areas. They work as well as hyper-regulated American streets. We keep forests of signs around for comfort because people erroneously think it can't hurt. It can hurt. There are books of guidelines for predicting whether road signs help or hurt. Traffic engineers don't follow the books because the boss already knows more regulation is better. When you start this this week in transportation policy, I'll write a few thousand more (laughs) words for you. I don't think I'll do that. You you do live in New Jersey, Vincent, so you could ask the governor of New Jersey for some help on that. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yes. He's got a lot of experience there. <laughs> the lawyers use terms like penumbral crime and aspirational law. These are laws that aren't expected to be obeyed, aren't taken seriously, and teach us that we have to decide for ourselves which laws to obey. Everybody who drives breaks the law, and I include those who say and even believe they don't. I don't break the law. I go the speed limit most of the time. Inspectors can enforce laws requiring signs saying hands must be washed. They cannot enforce laws saying hands must be washed. Given that we have a finite number of inspectors, what do you want them spending their time doing? I don't want you to inspect them, but I think having the sign up will get a certain number of people to wash their hands, and that will help. And on TWIP today, we talked about uh, neurocystocercosis, which is a a parasite you get in the brain when oh, you when you yeah. eat um, basically fecal material containing eggs from trichinella, and mm-hmm. this can happen in a in a restaurant where people are going in with fecal contamination. They have the eggs in their feces, and you eat them. This is going to go in your brain and cause you seizures. So I think that's a good reason to wash your hands in a in a restaurant bathroom. I'm going to go wash my hands right this minute. Exactly. <laughs> I have a ethanol hand sanitizer at my desk, so I think I'll apply some. You know, um, we do a case study on TWIP, and we had one in which a, a woman in her 30s from, I think, San Salvador, uh, she started having seizures. And the reason was she had these parasites in her brain. Now, you can get rid of them, but some people do die from this. And so if you just wash your hands, you know, you can avoid it. So if you would like parasites in your brain, don't wash your hands. That'll do it for TWIM 104. You can find us on iTunes and at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And we love your questions and comments. No matter what you say, we love it. Send them to TWIM at TWIV.TV. Michelle Swanson, of course, is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Did you actually speak with the authors this time? I did. I got to speak with both of them. That's cool. Now they are Johns. Where they? Where, uh, where the one, at, one at Scripps, Scripps and one at Johns Hopkins. Nice. It's a nice thing you do, Michelle. You, it's it's you a pleasure. It's really so you went pleasure. coast to coast this week. She did. She did. <laughs> a miracle of technology. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. I enjoyed it. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at my blog, virology.ws. I would like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and particularly Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. Check him out at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.